There are some 800 forensic scientists in the United Kingdom and they live and work in a world which most of us know little about. From time to time they hit the headlines because their findings have been disputed or even, as in the case of Dr. Alan Clift, discredited. But at their best they perform a unique and quite invaluable service. One in which analysis of a speck of blood or the type of soil found on a shoe or the angle at which a knife has entered the body can lead and often has led to arrest, prosecution and conviction. So now and for the next five weeks we shall be seeing how cleverly and convincingly forensic scientists use their skills to help unravel the most seemingly abstruse of murder mysteries. So if any of you are thinking of carrying out the perfect crime, why don't you wait and see what you're up against? Our first story happened in 1984 when a series of strange and horrible incidents took place in an otherwise peaceful English village. The professional people taking part, scientists, police officers, etc., are those who actually conducted the investigations. The participants in the drama are played by actors and names and settings have been changed. I'm busy. Pig. Stockhill. Alan Stockhill. Rydale Farm. Yeah. Some bastard's trying to threaten me. It was a phone call. A bloke's voice. I didn't recognize it. it. Said something like, I'm going to blow your balls off. Then there was a letter that came. It just said, you've ruined my sister's life and now you must pay. That went into the bin straight away. What's going on? Whose sister? I don't know whose sister. Jesus Christ, will you shut up? I've had it up to here, Kate. Now just shut up before I lose my temper. Don't answer it. Yeah, one minute. It's your mother. Hello, how are you? Yes, we're fine. Everything's fine. Kids are okay. Rip up to date. Yes, I know it's a little early. I've got to look at the sheep. No, no, everything's fine.
Good girl. So it's all cone, Pete. Are you got any more about? In the back of that van, I think. Okay. I've been out about nine, nine thirty to check the animals. I didn't think of checking the bone. Well, at this stage of the inquiry, the intended victim appeared to be Stockhill, as he normally drove the Volvo. She'd normally go in her car, the Renault, but she's it's a bugger to start in the way, so she took mine. While we were at the scene, the postman arrived and he had a number of letters to deliver to the, to the farm. One of these looked unusual in the manner in which it was addressed and we asked the uh, officers from the bomb disposal squad to examine that in case there was um, another explosive device contained in it. Please sent me the threatening letter, but I realised fairly early on that I was not going to be able to identify the author because he'd effectively disguised his writing by overwriting each individual letter. However, the you next note was far more revealing. On the back of the note, there was impressions of a doodle. I realised that this was potentially far more important because through the doodle we might identify the notepad that it came from and through that, the person responsible. When you've lived in the village as long as I have, you. You get to know everybody, and it's very much sort of live and let live. Over the years, of course, I might have stepped on a few tools, but that's life, isn't it? Stockhill seemed genuinely surprised that anyone should hate him enough to want to try and kill him. But he did supply us with a number of names of people who may have borne him a grudge. It was possible that the, the person responsible may try again, so we had to uh, mount a 24-hour guard at the farm and of course commence inquiries in the village. Peter Davis, the village carpenter, 
had had a row with Stockhill over the use of some land, and apparently he was severely depressed following the death of his son some months before. It was possible he may have been responsible. We looked at people who had had unsatisfactory business deals with Stockhill, and there were a number of them. And there was a person whose dog had been shot by Stockhill because he'd been worrying sheep, and we looked at him as well. Clive Barrett possibly had the knowledge and the means to construct a bomb and place it in the car. He had previously worked in a quarry and had knowledge and access to explosives. Stockhill told us that he'd had an affair with Barrett's wife. And these matters made Barrett of particular interest to us. through both skins. Mm. A shot, no damage. Mm, it's obviously something that's, that's fragmented, I think. We've got some, yeah, some there as well. And some up at the prop shaft. Basically, if we could recover parts of the bomb and reconstruct it, uh, we could perhaps get some pointers as to who had made it. One has once come right backwards here. This has obviously been a fair size fragment. Searching the car was a very difficult job, as it turned out, because many fragments of the bomb had found their way into hollow sections within the bodywork. And it turned into more or less a tin opener job. basic criterion was to identify anything which wasn't part of a Volvo or part of its innocent everyday contents. Another bit of it? It's got to be a bit of a pipe or something, that hasn't it? Yeah. It's a thready dagger on the inside or the outside. It's a mild steel of sorts. It was a jigsaw of many, many pieces, probably running into hundreds. Many pieces missing, all of the parts we had damaged and, of course, no plan to work to. Some enormous pieces of shrapnel had been recovered from Mrs. Stockhill's wounds. Once we had these, we were able to complete our reconstruction of the bomb. It was a piece of steel pipe, recently sawn from a longer length of pipe. It was a particularly horrific device, a propellant containing the explosive nitroglycerin, together with about four and a half thousand lead shotgun pellets, all packed into a tin can in the pipe and fired by an electric detonator connected to the car's electrics. It was really more like a sawn-off shotgun than a bomb, and was clearly intended, quite viciously, to shoot the driver through the seat. Mrs. Stockhill was very lucky to survive. Got some flowers. Look at this. Front page news. I don't want to see them. Whoever did this to you, Kate, I swear if I find Stop him, I'll tell them. Stop it, please. I hate this talk. 
You're looking all right. How are you feeling? As well as can be expected. Good. They took ten ounces of lead out of my legs and half of my left thigh has been blown away. I've lost most of the back of my right knee and I've got a compound fracture to my right ankle. How's that for starters? This is down to you, Alan. Who could hate you this much? Whoever it is, sure as hell isn't going to try anything with your men creeping all over the place. Look, I'm not arguing about it. I want your men off my farm. We weren't happy about this at all. We were there for his protection and the protection of his family. But if he wanted us to leave, then we had no authority to stay. We did, however, warn him about the dangers of taking the law into his own hands before we left. Three weeks into the inquiry, Peter Davis, the village carpenter, was seen on his way to Stockhill's farm. He said he'd come to ask about my wife. So I invited him in for a coffee. Everything was quite friendly when suddenly he just started screaming that I'd killed his son. And then he lunged at me. He kept on coming. I told him to stop. But he kept on coming like he was possessed. This incident, the attack by Davis on Stockhill, suggested that Davis was responsible for the threatening letters, the anonymous telephone calls, and the placing of the bomb in the Volvo motor car. We searched Davis's land and found a section of metal pipe. Forensic examination proved that the bomb had been made from a section of that pipe, which in turn suggested that Davis was the man responsible. The man's body is lying on the floor on his back. There are two shotgun wounds in the front of the shirt, one at the top of the chest and the one lower one over the left nipple. A large amount of blood has come out of the one at the top of the chest. 
I was particularly perturbed about the fact that the knife was grasped in the dead man's hand. Now, for this to have happened, rigor mortis must have set in instantaneously at the moment of death, something which is extremely rare, and, as a matter of fact, the evening before I checked for rigor and it was not present. Police told us Stockhill's version of what had happened, and it all sounded perfectly reasonable. However, when we began to examine the kitchen, I had my doubts. Clearly, he hasn't gone straight out of here, through the hallway. He seems to have come round, mm -hmm. around this area here, dripping blood as he goes, perhaps stopping. The pattern of blood on the floor didn't suggest a violent struggle at all. The circular stains indicated, in fact, that he had been standing still, just dripping blood. If he had been involved in a violent struggle, I would have expected to see a different pattern of blood altogether. There would have been more splashing of blood, stains with tails attached to them, indicating a severe and violent movement. And that goes right under the back of that chair there, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's about one, two, three, four, five, seven drops under there. Okay. Another problem was, there was obviously a lot of blood in the kitchen, but in the area of the hall, between the kitchen and the bottom of the staircase, there was absolutely no blood at all. If the man's story was true, that he had been chased down there, why hadn't he left a trail of blood? Okay. Down the side here. Uh, there's one there. That's one, isn't it? Quite a large sort. Again, that's dripped out straight down, hasn't it? Onto the chair. Yes. What's fallen over, of course. Let's move around there. Come on down there. Oh, here's some more. Oh, right. And it seems to go all across the bank. Mm hmm. Yeah, quite extensive. And that's not blood that's dripped down, is it? That's blood. It's obviously been smeared right across the back of the chair yeah. as though somebody's got hold of that and dragged the hand across it. Laboratory tests proved that this was Stockhill's blood, presumably from his hands. But when we came to examine the gun, there was absolutely no blood on there at all. How could a man who was bleeding profusely not leave any blood on the gun when he pulled the trigger? That's Davis's blood. Right. Then there was the dead man's shirt. Stain four. That's Stockhill's. And then we've got a big area here that's all Stockhill's blood. I was surprised to find so much of Stockhill's blood on it. The only way I could reproduce this pattern of staining was to actually stand over the shirt and drip blood directly onto it. This suggested that Stockhill, in fact, had stood over the body for some considerable time dripping blood on there. This didn't agree with his story at all. By this time, I was 80% convinced that he was lying. I was asked to look at photographs of the cut on Stockhill's chest and I was immediately uh, perturbed. For somebody else to have made this injury, Stockhill would have to have remained still while the other person put his knife on the left shoulder and dragged it right across the body down to the right hand side. And this of course implied no movement by Stockhill whatsoever, something that was highly improbable. The characteristics of the cut were, in my opinion, those of a self-inflicted injury. It looked very much as if Davis had been set up as a scapegoat. The case against Stockhill was getting stronger, but we still lacked the necessary evidence to arrest him on a charge of murder.
I photograph the page and then the doodle impression. And I found that they matched perfectly. I was therefore able to say definitely that the U next note came from the notepad that was found at Stockhills Farm. This, in fact, was a major breakthrough. We were able to prove that Stockhill had written the note uh, and had therefore, by implication, planned the murder of his wife. The Birmingham Laboratory sent me the original anonymous letter received by Stockhill. I was asked to test it for saliva. However, when I came to examine it, what I did find was a clump of fibres trapped in the gum beneath the flap. The police sent me a number of items of clothing from both Stockhill and Davis. And it was fibres from one of Stockhill's sweaters which matched those fibres in the envelope. This was a good indication that Stockhill, in fact, had sent the letter to himself. We'd been working for months on the assumption that the allegations Stockhill had made were true. We suspected, of course, that they, they weren't. We were now able to prove that they were a pack of lies. And we had sufficient evidence to arrest him and charge him with attempting to murder his wife. Obviously, we could never be 100% sure of what had happened in that house that night, but with the evidence available, there was only one scenario I could come up with. We knew that Davis had been lured to the house on the pretext of mending some furniture. At this point, Stockhill was not bleeding, so there was no blood on the gun. stepped around the kitchen leaving a trail of blood to make it look as though he'd been involved in a fight and a chase. He then cut himself again across the chest to make it look an even more horrific attack. And standing over the dead man, he'd dripped a lot of blood onto the body. Putting the knife in the dead man's hand was his final mistake. The real Alan Stockhill was sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment. His wife sat through the whole of the trial in order to convince herself of his guilt. She has now made a full recovery. Stockhill stood to gain a hundred thousand pounds in insurance money from her death.
Next week, indelible evidence enters the bizarre world of Joey Silberman, an only child accused of murdering both his parents in November 1981. And the cases featured in the series can be found in this BBC book.